bhujelas or like you can have some electronic guitars or you can basically have some ninja technique as well so to stop the people if they run out of time and there is a new concept called buying time so that was introduced by costello et al in asia at asia crypt 2018 so they are so uh, uh, apart from the limited time uh, the challenge was if you can drink this this beer bottle uh, bottom up in one go then you get some extra time so for our case uh, for stopping people here i'll use this uh, basically <laughs> i'll use this whistle to stop people and for online people i have a better option so just you can mute them and for buying time what we have so i have this water bottle because no question of beer so i can so if you want to buy time you may use this okay so now let's go to the main part so here is basically the speaker so we'll start with orgo bhattacharya then devolina ghatak julian litke and then pedram hoseni followed by muhammad usama sardar jyotirmoy pramanik chandan goswami and surendra talwari so we'll start with two offline speakers and we'll start with orgo bhattacharya so orgo ছিল হ্যালো সো গুড ইভনিং এভরি ওয়ান আই উইল ট্রাই টু স্টর্ম থ্রু দিস পিপিটি দিস ইজ অ্যাবাউট রিসেন্ট পেপার হুইচ আই ওয়াজ এ পার্ট অফ দিস থ্রি কো অথর্স এজ মেনশন ডন বোর্ড অ্যান্ড দিস ইজ কারেন্টলি আন্ডার রিভিউ সো নট পাবলিশড ইয়েট so i will first give a brief motivation behind this work so uh, in crypto 19 chain uh, et al proposed three variants of even some of even mansu ciphers so in these two cases uh, as you can see they used in one case they used one single permutation and two independently sampled keys and in the other case they used two different permutation and used the same secret key and they proved in both the cases that uh, the security they obtained is the birthday bound security that is n by 2 bit security and in the third variant they uh, used two dif different permutations and two independently sampled secret keys which helped them obtain beyond birthday bound security that is 2n by 3 bit security to be precise and they also proved that to be tight but uh, as you can see in this construction it's a uh, uh, fixed length prf that is the input is n bit and the output is n bit also so uh, in this context we try to address the question that uh, uh, we we try to uh, convert it to a variable length output 
PRF actually. So, uh, by a click on. Yeah, sorry. So we tried to address uh, this question in our work that how to stretch the output side because in this in their construction it was the constant output length PRF. So yeah. So this was uh, our uh, not not the exact construct construction. This was the building block of our construction. It's the algorithm for generating random key stream. We named it as Zor PP start. Uh, as you can see in this case, uh, we actually, uh, the idea was like this, that uh, uh, the messages were coming in terms of blocks. We divided the message blocks in some chunks. Uh, for example, in this particular case, the length of the chunk was uh, two, two message blocks. So uh, you, as you can see in the left, uh, in the left half there is a processing and in the right half there is uh, another processing. These uh, each half is processing one single chunk of messages and the, the first line of the left half is being exhorted with the second, second line of the left half to give uh, a beyond birthday bound secure uh, output which is the first key stream which will which will exhort with the first message block to give uh, the first cipher, cipher text block and it will go on uh, processing the messages like that and yeah, one thing to observe is that in each uh, chunk, the permutations we have used, they are different permutations because we are following the third variant of uh, chain et al proposal that the permutations are different and the keys used are uh, independently sampled. So, uh, and then this is the construction where we are actually uh, exhorting the message, message blocks to get the cipher text out and using the in using the nonce in the input of the construction and the nonce are padded and the padding is used as unique padding for each message chunk processing but uh, as we are following the uh, the third variant where we saw that uh, a single input is giving beyond but beyond secure output if we are using defined permutation and independent keys. So in this case also, the uh, key stream will, um, uh, once we exhort the key stream with the message, then we get the uh, beyond but beyond secure cipher text blocks. This is the uh, key scheduling matrix which we used. And in uh, our particular case, we instantiated the variables with these values. And in that case, we named our construction and C and CPP only. We obtained as expected beyond but the one security with a factor of one by W squared. W is the length of each block. So it's a constant factor. So this was an intuitive question that uh, if we can reduce the number of master keys to one, uh, we analyzed this case and we got a negative answer to this question actually that if we use a single secret master key then uh, we can't go beyond but the bound security and we will be restricted to n by 2 bit security only uh, more uh, precisely uh, the uh, uh, key scheduling matrix which we can see here the it must have one necessary criteria that each of its columns should be linearly independent uh, that is, it should be full rank if we have to go beyond birthday bound security. And another question which we try to address is that if, if we can reduce the number of permutation to one. So uh, in each uh, block, uh, each, in each uh, chunk of blocks, we, uh, for example, uh, the length is W, then uh, we had W plus one permutation calls. And all those W plus one permutations calls were made to different permutations. So we tried to uh, minimize that number. And we got a positive answer here that if we domain separate one single permutation, then one single permutation of uh, a little bit uh, bigger size should suffice. So this was the uh, one, this was one single message chunk processing in the previous from the previous picture, where we can see that in the previous case we used P0, P1, and P2, three different permutations. In this case, we just domain separated them uh, by three different bits. Uh, in this particular case, we have to use two bits because zero, one, and two. So, and we will get again two, two power two n by three bit security with a factor of one by w to the buffer. Thank you. Any question? <laughs>
Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Devalina Ghatak from TCG Crest, Kolkata. Over to you, Devalina. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dutta. Uh, so the topic that I am going to uh, talk about today, it is uh, a bit different from crypt uh, pure cryptography, but it is something related to security. Uh, so it is, uh, I will uh, discuss some uh, recent techniques that have been developed for synthetic data generation, that is secure synthetic data generation, and I will discuss what that is in my talk. And then I will just briefly say uh, about uh, an intuitive idea about what uh, work we are thinking of doing, but it is an unpublished work, incomplete work till now. So I will just discuss about mainly about the problem that we are thinking about. Okay. So uh, I'm mainly uh, concentrating on statistical data sets. So what is a statistical data sets? It is uh, mainly we are talking about micro data where there are uh, some n individuals and some n attributes corresponding to each individual. And uh, due to release of statistical data sets, some privacy issues may arise. So what that is to understand that I have uh, given a example so this data set was taken from kaggle so uh, uh, they have released this uh, uh, insecure data set here so you can see that uh, this is an original data set which is available in kaggle so uh, these are uh, some information related to some individuals they are age gender then uh, bmi uh, this, this is a med medical data set basically and uh, then uh, the charges that each individual have paid for their treatment, that is also uh, mentioned here. So now uh, this is uh, available in the market, this kind of data set. Now, uh, uh, suppose some intruder who is trying to guess something or uh, from this data set, somebody is trying to see that what charges have a particular individual paid. Okay, uh, so that might hurt the person's sentiment in some way or the other. So, uh, or somebody may also uh, get hurt by uh, uh, the attributes like smoker, whether they are or not. Okay, so uh, here I will talk about the kind of attack that uh, uh, we are thinking about here. So, uh, at first now, a person, uh, an intruder may have an idea about the individual he is targeting about. He may know that that person is uh, a, a male senior citizen and he has three children. These are very common things that a person usually knows uh, about uh, an individual. And he also lives in the Southeast region. Right. So these kind of in informations are usually uh, well known to everyone. These are public informations. Now, if some public if some intruder has this kind of information about his target one. So now from only from those public informations, you can see clearly that there is only uh, so only one row here and it was in the whole data set. It, come, uh, it consisted of about 3000 or more than that uh, individuals and there was only one uh, row uh, who, who was a senior citizen and uh, he lived in the Southeast region and he was male and he has three children. So these informations were corresponding to only one person. So from that information, the charges paid by them are, uh, one can find out. Also they can find out whether they're smoker or not. These kind of informations get leaked. So uh, whenever there is uh, some raw uh, uh, data set released, getting released in the public, these kind of security questions may arise. Okay. Now, um, what is desirable and what is not desirable in this situation? So uh, for a statistician or for an industrial person who is trying to find out some statistical information from uh, um, the release uh, data, what, what they're trying to say, they are, they, what is desirable to them is the statistical information, right? So 
uh, these are kind, uh, the desirable questions may sound like this that how many PA people have income ranging between this or less than 60,000, 50,000 or something like that. But for one person, uh, if the information is not available, then that is not a problem for the statistician. So uh, one may ignore these individual informations and only keep the statistical informations while releasing something from a data set. So whenever an information is getting released from a data set, we may ask the question whether it is secure or not. So in the last, uh, this problem has been dealt uh, for uh, more than 15 years now. So uh, the concepts that have been developed for the privacy guarantees are like there are uh, these privacy guarantees like differential privacy or its variants. Uh, so they ensure a privacy guarantee to any statistical information released from a data set. Okay, so uh, till now people have seen uh, many um, differentially private means, medians, and some common statistical functions like that, or even quantiles. Uh, so people have come across that. Now, uh, one very challenging problem in here is the generation of a synthetic data. <laughs> so so uh, is the generation of synthetic data set? So, so what is a synthetic data set? Uh, a synthetic data set is a false representation of the true data set. So <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I think the time is over. So I may skip. Okay, these are some uh, well-known techniques and this was uh, intuitive idea. So, so I didn't get time <laughs> to discuss. Okay, thank you Devalina. Uh, so, round of applause for her. Okay, so the next talk would be by, by Julian and uh, Julian from University of Stuttgart, Germany. So, over to you, Julian. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, absolutely fine. Oh, perfect. Um, hello. Um, my name is Julian Dietke, and I present your Ordinos, um, which was published at Euro S&P 2020. Um, it is joint work with Ralf Küsters, Johannes Müller, Daniel Rausch, and Andreas Vogt. Um, so, Ordinos is the first provable, secure, verifiable, tally-hiding, remote e-voting system. So, let us briefly discuss what these properties are. So verifiability means that parties are able to check whether the claimed result of the election is correct. This check can be performed by individual voters, but it is not restricted to participants of the voting protocol. Thus, everyone can verify the election result. The next property I want to talk about is tally hiding. In order to explain what tally hiding is, let me first give you an intuition on how traditional e-voting systems and paper-based elections work. So I will roughly go over a typical voting flow. Um, so we have a set of voters who cast their ballots and send them to the bulletin board. Then the votes are counted and the full tally is published. Now we can compute the result of the election um, based on the full tally, but often, the voting result consists of a single winner or a ranking of candidates. Thus, this voting flow reveals more information than necessary. In particular, we are only interested in the election result, not in the full tally, which is nevertheless also published. Revealing the full tally has several downsides. So, for example, in some elections, like within companies, student associations, or in boardroom elections, it might be embarrassing for the losing candidates to publish the possibly low number of votes they received. Additionally, publishing the full tally lowers the privacy of the voters. For example, 
for elections that are carried out among a small set of voters, like in boardroom or jury votings, revealing the full tally leads to a low level of privacy because the vote of a single voter is only hidden behind a low number of other votes. Therefore, even if you only want to know who won the election, a voter might not vote for her actual preference, knowing that nevertheless the full tally is revealed, and hence her vote does not really remain private. Moreover, some elections have several rounds. In particular, they might involve runoff elections. In order to get unbiased voters' opinions, one might not want to reveal the tally of intermediate elections, except for the information which candidate move on to the next round. So these examples illustrate that for some situations, it is desirable to not publish the full tally as part of the telling procedure, but to only publish the actual election result. This concept is called tally hiding and it works as follows. So in tally hiding e-voting, we only reveal the election result in which we are interested. In particular, the full tally is not revealed. The concept of tally hiding has many use cases. For example, as mentioned before, it can protect the privacy of the voters and candidates. There are some associations that use tally hiding for exact this reason. But what about verifiability? How can we verify the election result is correct if we do not see the full tally? Can we verify the result and hence trust the result? And the answer for this is yes, we can. So on the one hand, we have verifiability. And on the other hand, we have tally hiding, where we only want to reveal the election result. With Ordinos, we combine both of these properties. Ordinos is the first provable, secure, verifiable, and tally hiding e-voting system. At its core, Ordinos combines homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs, and MPC protocols to achieve the desired properties. With that being said, Ordinos opens new possibilities for votings because it allows for elections that cannot be done with traditional e-voting schemes or traditional paper-based voting. So thanks for your attention. And if you want to learn more about Ordinos, you can find information in our technical report linked here on the slides. Okay, can I continue? Professor Datta, uh, we can't hear your audio. Hello, can you hear, hear me now? Yes. Hello. Okay. Yes. Okay, so thank you, Julian, for your talk and welcome, Pedram. So, Pedram, you can continue. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, welcome to this short talk on DY Star, a modular symbolic verification framework for cryptographic protocols. This is joint work with Karthik Bhagavan, Abhishek Bishavat, Kwiko Edo, Ralf Küsters, Guido Schmitz, and Tim Wörtele. And this work is published at EuroSNP and at CCS this year. You can find all papers and code at our project website, reprosec.org. So when looking at mechanized symbolic protocol analysis, there are basically two big lines of work. On the one hand, there are specialized Dolevyao style analysis tools, 
such as Tamarine and Poverif. And on the other hand, we have tools based on dependent type systems, for example, RCF and F7. Now, often these dependent type systems are basically specialized programming languages. So let's take a look at both sides now. Um, so roughly speaking, the Dolevyao approach focuses more on the protocol core, which leads to more abstract models that can be analyzed in a mostly automated manner. This approach makes it easier to analyze security properties that require a global view, for example, forward secrecy, because it analyzes the whole protocol and all its possible execution traces at once. At the same time, this all at once analysis usually requires bounds on data structures and bounds on loops. Dolevyao style tools also support equational theories. Now, on the other hand, the, de the dependent type approach focuses more on implementation aspects, which leads to modular proofs that are usually local to single functions. In turn, this means that there is no global view, which makes it hard or even impossible to state and prove properties like forward secrecy. The models are written in specialized programming languages, and therefore the analysis takes place at the implementation level, and models are not restricted in using unbounded structures and loops. And for the same reason, the models are usually executable and can even be interoperable with other protocol implementations. But in many cases, dependent type analyses require monotonic state and more user interaction to, pr to prove properties. So as you can see, both approaches have their strengths and weaknesses, and we want to combine their, their strengths. And this is where DY star comes into play. So let me go to that slide again. And here, yes. So DY star bridges the gap between these two sides. And we built DY star on top of the F star programming language, which is a fully fledged programming language aimed at program verification. So to ease the proof burden for the user, F star relies on a SMT solver to discharge proof obligations. And by this providing a good amount of proof automation. So let's take a look at how DY star has been used so far. We use DY star to model and analyze the signal messaging protocol, which is used in popular messaging applications and thus by billions of people. Leveraging the strengths of DY star, our analysis of the signal protocol is the first to account for an unbounded number of rounds of the ratcheting sub protocol. And at the same time, proving global security properties like forward secrecy and post compromise security. A second case study is our analysis of the ACME protocol. This protocol is used to automatically issue TLS certificates, and the most prominent user is probably Let's Encrypt, which has issued well over a billion certificates so far. So our analysis features a very precise and detailed model of the ACME protocol, comprising more than 16,000 lines of code, which makes it one of the largest and most in-depth analysis in literature. In fact, our model is so detailed that by using our client model as an application layer library, we can obtain valid TLS certificates from Let's Encrypt. In addition, we also modeled and analyzed a small set of standard protocols, namely Nitem Schröder Löw, ISO-DH, and ISO-CHEM. So with FSTAR being new, there is lots of interesting work to be done. For example, we want to implement the web infrastructure model on top of DY Star. The web infrastructure model is the most detailed formal model of the web and was successfully used for many analysis so far. We also plan on extending DY star with equivalence properties and computational analysis capabilities. So before I conclude two more remarks, there will be more about tool-based protocol analysis in the invited talk tomorrow by Karthik Bhagavan. And also if you're interested in this work, our group in Stuttgart is looking for PhD students and postdocs. For more information, please visit our website and thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, uh, Pedram. Thank you for his your wonderful talk and finishing before uh, time. So let's move to our ne next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Mohammad Usama Sardar from Technik University of Dresden, Germany. So over to you, Mohammad. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this talk is related to the CCC white paper. And if you have been following um, the ISCR conferences, you might know about the three episodes that we have already discussed. If not, I will like to just remind you or give an overview of what we saw in the last two, last three episodes. So in the first and second episode, we <clears throat> talked about what Confidential Computing Consortium has in its white paper as the claims, which is uh, one of them is mentioned here. Unlike the term confidential computing, several of the terms used in the diagram have multiple comp competing definitions. And if you see the diagram referred here is this one, which I replicated here. The first claim is that there is a unique definition of confidential computing, which we already um, clarified that it's not the case. And secondly, also that the competing definitions of other terms, including homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation was the, the part of episode one and two. So what we saw in the episode three was that uh, there are other vague and incomplete definitions of uh, trusted execution environments in the white paper. And also some weird terms like trusted execution environment, environments, which don't make much sense. And there was, so, so the definition of confidential computing itself was based on hardware based trusted execution environments. And the term itself was not clearly defined what actually distinguishes a hardware based trusted execution environment from a software based trusted execution environment. So now we proceed with the uh, new part of, uh, or the fourth episode, which is uh, talking about the programmability here in the diagram, you see this part programmable. So one of the two definitions by the consortium, which actually contradict uh, was based on this programmability and what they define or talk about uh, describe programmability is that some trusted execution environments may be programmable with arbitrary code while some may only support a limited set of operations. And this sentence has no clarification whether the definition of programmable here or this set actually is meant to be this programmability with arbitrary code, or uh, secondly, the, possible, uh, the inter possible interpretation on the other end is that this, uh, this part with the limited set of operations is this also going to be considered as programmable. So there are at least these two interpretations and a number of interpretations in between that what exactly is the programmability. So, uh, and for completeness, we have a set of programmability here. It should also be shown in the software trusted execution environments. Attestation is one of the most important processes of uh, confidential computing. And what the consortium defines is Attestation is the process by which one party called a verifier assesses the trustworthiness of a potentially untrusted peer that is the attester. It's not clear here what exactly trustworthiness means and it's really uh, important to clarify that the most important or the core property of attestation is measurement which actually is not visible from the definition itself. And uh, then Attestation, as I said, is a core part of confidential computing. The reason being that as opposed to fully homomorphic encryption and uh, multi-party computation or other solutions, here in confidential computing, we need to trust the hardware and at least one layer of the software stack. And therefore, there is a greater need uh, for remote attestation in this case. And without attestation, Confidential computing itself is incomplete. Uh, I mean, the, the, it's the core part of confidential computing. It's computing without uh, attestation is no better than any conventional computing solution paradigms. The reason being the remote user cannot distinguish a malicious platform from a genuine one. This is the property which actually helps establish this trust. And even with alternatives of attestation, for example, authentication process, even if you have that, that is insufficient. What we find really commish is that uh, the, the, the consortium itself kind of acknowledges the importance of attestation by saying that any attack that could compromise the attestation of a TE instance could lead to a workload or data being compromised in turn. However, this does not replicate in the definition of confidential computing, and this is our uh, one of the major concerns and we find it incomplete uh, definition of confidential computing without having an explicit mention of attestation process in the 
definition. So that's what we claim that attestation should be a really a part of the definition of the confidential computing. So these are um, the references which have been used in this uh, presentation. And I thank you all for your attention. And I hope to see you in the next episode where I will describe um, in detail uh, about the comparison done by the Confidential Computing Consortium on with of the confidential computing with the homomorphic encryption and TPM like technologies. And there I will describe the problems in the comparison and the survey they did. Thank you very much and hope to see you in the next episode. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And again, finishing on the time. So uh, our next speaker would be Jyotimoy Pramanik from Taki Government College. So Jyotimoy, over to you. Okay. Am I audible as well as my slide is visible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Go on. So welcome. I welcome every one of you. And this talk is about something called the cost of sharing a secret. And uh, this uh, is a there is already an existing notion of a share size in secret sharing. And I will be coming to what a cost means in uh, sharing a secret. So. Secret sharing uh, achieves something as follows. Suppose you have a very sensitive or dangerous piece of information that is uh, that is something which you don't want to fall into hands of your competitors or enemies. So what you do is you split the piece of information into certain parts, maybe finite or according to some recent works, uh, maybe infinite number of parts in a way that only some qualified combinations of those parts or shares are able to reconstruct your secret back. Whereas the other, every other combination, which we will be calling as forbidden sets or forbidden uh, combinations, those are unable to reconstruct the secret back. So the formal definition of these properties are as follows. We call it the privacy property that uh, any, forbidden, uh, any forbidden collection of shares gives you nothing that is already not derivable from the uh, distribution of the secret space itself. And uh, there is something called the correctness property, which says that uh, even if even if, uh, if a qualified set uh, pools its shares, you will be getting the entire secret back. And uh, the idea is as follows. There is a space of secrets and there is a special participant called the dealer. What he does, he generates a uh, few spaces which uh, look random from the point of view of outsiders and values from these uh, spaces called the share spaces will be given to the participating participating people or the shareholders. And the notion is that the ith participant will be getting uh, a share size of some value, which is the cardinality of the ith share space. Now, motivation behind this work is from an implementation point of view that we might need a prior budgeting of the work to be done. And this is very clearly visible in the case of KN threshold secret sharing, where K is a very small threshold compared to the total number of participants involved. You may think of it as a 2N or maybe some other uh, lesser valued thresholds. And also there is the notion of flexibility in case of uh, malicious adversaries in secret sharing, which uh, sort of invokes this work. So what we do is nothing very um, unimaginable. We just consider the union of all such shared spaces and consider the cardinality of that union set as the cost of a secret sharing. Now, this very, very little change is going to address the problems that I mentioned earlier. And here are some immediate observations that in case of ideal secret sharing, we know that the share of uh, so the share of size is as same as the share of the secret. And uh, in case there is uh, n participants involved, uh, this changes. And in case of ramp secret sharing, we know the sh share size is lesser than the share of secret. And whenever we are dealing with malicious adversaries, the share size is known to be greater than the size of secret. And there are some other notions such as evolving and hybrid of these notions as well. And the notion of flexibility is uh, something as follows, that if the security parameter in a secret sharing scheme is independent of the secret size, size, 
then the secret sharing is said to have flexibility. Now it can be observed in the following schemes that uh, these schemes have flexibility and uh, accordingly the cost of the secret sharing is uh, listed in the third column and of course in some cases it is difficult and uh, we need to set parameters uh, we need to set bounds and parameters uh, according to the secret sharing scheme and these areas are still open and there is a recent uh, notion of almost semi honest model where in case of infinite number of uh, shareholders involved every participant will be able to test whether the participants arriving before him or her are submitting correct shares or not during the reconstruction of the secret so in this model it is still open whether uh, what can be the cost of secrets and all and in case of hybrid secret sharings as well and these are some open directions that may be explored thank you thanks jyotirma thanks for this wonderful talk and really wonderful slides so let's move to our next talk so the next talk would be by chandan goshami from presidency university so chandan over to you can you share your slide Chandan, can you share your slides? Chandan, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sure. 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 So can you help me share my screen? I'm not able to share my screen. Ah, uh, can you click on the sharing screens? Yes, sir. Next. Um, then, then, I mean, share the whole screen or the whole application. Uh, um, Kandan, is that a presentation or a movie? Yes, presentation. Or have you saved it on the desk?
So hello everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the all organizers of Inductive 2021 for giving me the opportunity to deliver my presentation. So my title of my presentation, title of my presentation is PP distribution scheme for IT devices with enhanced resiliency. So first, so first I introduce. So first I introduce IoT. So what is IoT? IoT, we all know that IoT is Internet of Things. And uh, next uh, we can see that the, in the meantime, uh, uh, Internet of Things, all devices connect via Internet of Things. But uh, in the world where it connected IoT devices are grown exponentially. Since the IoT has a lot of applications. It's very important to understand the security aspect of it in case of attack from any adversary, uh, things might go very wrong. So from the, my target is to give a security aspect of IoT devices via mathematical point of view. So for that, we want to roll of the cryptography and the cryptography is only as good as the security of keys. So secure management of keys describe the entire life cycle the life cycle of keys and the keys must be pre-distributed before deployment. But uploading them to the devices due to the lack of a secure mechanism for key distribution during communication and the combinatorial designs application in key distribution has been considered as a suitable method due to the low overhead in the shared key discovery phase. Generally, public key mechanism involves huge computational costs. So for limitation on computational capabilities and the storage capacities, Symmetric mechanism are preferred. Next, I define the how the security or privacy preserve in the IP device via and parameter resiliency. So resiliency is the ability of a network to continue to operate it in presence of compromised nodes. And the amount of resiliency indicates how many network connections are uncompromised by capturing the number of IP devices. So from this point of view, I introduce and has how has function our role in the security aspect of IoT devices. Here we see that if here four nodes, uh, that means four devices, device number one, number two, number nine, and number six. And the two device nine and six communicate via the key K5. And the number of device one and device number six is communicated with K5. So if any adversary or attacker captured the key K5, then he break the link between the devices number nine and devices six, as also as the devices number one and the devices number six. But if we add the keys of has power, then we see that here this picture that if the any attacker um, compromise the link between the num node, uh, device number nine and device number six, but he cannot, cannot break up the link between the device number one and the device number six because the we all know the property of S function. So next I introduce the my scheme. The this scheme is base scheme. So base scheme basically an KP distribution scheme, deterministic KP distribution scheme, where the number of nodes is the uh, is uh, n choose two and the total number of nodes is n choose two and the number of keys of each node is 2 into n minus 2. So here put an example for n equals to 7, so 21 many nodes, and we consider all members of the ith row of the matrix as the members of the ith group, and any two group, number of elements of common, uh, common elements of any two group is 1. And for that, I um, describe the key construction of the base scheme. So for any node between the total number of nodes, then we can find in mathematical way that the uh, that the number of nodes of any uh, number of keys of any two nodes is two into n minus two. So here for n equals to seven. So here the node ID is fifteen, and the total number of nodes total number of nodes is twenty one, and uh, number of keys of each node is ten. So basically, now we find the common keys of two nodes. The number of common keys between any two pair of nodes is either four or n minus two. 
now given two nodes i and j and we, we let us try to find the structure of the common keys so let us assume the keys i and j and there are four possibilities so total number of common keys between two nodes either four or n minus two and next we construct base scheme to base subset scheme here for an example n equals to seven so for depth one total number of nodes 21 and the number of nodes from create from each node is the total number of keys so we already uh, see that the total number of keys of each node is 10 so from any node in depth one the total number of nodes create is 10 and depth three and total number of nodes each create is nine as we already uh, told that the number of keys of each depth is uh, decreased by the cardinality of one next i introduce the bidirectional hash chain for base scheme subset as an improvement to the gain of beta resiliency we use the bidirectional hash chain of base subset in such a case the structure of the keys in the key ring of a node is the triple coordinate and this used via hash function and now we already see the PLS is the resiliency parameter introduced the uh, all of the previous paper and the uh, lesser value of PLS give the better resiliency but we introduce a new resiliency parameter TS and TS is the average value of the probability of two non-restricted nodes to compromise all the links between A and B. So this is an uh, where TS is... Chandan, can you quickly wrap it up? Yeah. So PLS is the PLS is the proportion of two numbers, CS and L. CS is the number of links, compromise of the uncompromised nodes upon compromise of X random nodes. And it is the total number of links in the original network. But we introduce a new resiliency parameter, capital TS. So for capital TS, we introduce TABS. For TABS, for two secure connected target nodes A and B, and for a given value of S, TABS measures the probability of finding as many non-restricted nodes to compromise all the links between A and B. Here, script is the number of nodes in the network, and the target nodes are the two nodes which communication and attacker is trying to play. So, capital TS is defined the TABS summation of all TBS over all the pair of two target nodes and uh, uh, proportion to script n in n minus script n minus one. So, from the definition of TS, first trace all nodes which compromise leads to uh, capture all links between a pair Someone of. Can you quickly wrap it up? Just. So this is the experimental graph. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. And so we move to the last talk of this RAM session. So Dr. Talari, uh, are you there? Dr. Talari? Uh, he is there uh, backstage, but his video and audio are both muted. Dr. Th Talari, can you can you unmute yourself? Dr. Talari, can you unmute yourself? So no contact number with me as well. Uh, so And thank you very much uh, for Professor Adhikari, Professor Prinil, and Professor Kaster for uh, giving. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so it, it, it's really enjoyable five minutes talk. See
So thank you very much, everybody. It was a great session. See you all tomorrow. See you all tomorrow then. Yeah. Bye -bye. It was really a quite enjoyable session. Uh, we had seven speakers. All of them performed really well. I'm not sure who is going to send their papers to cryptology, but surely we enjoyed all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, then see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.